Hello there. Are you sure you're in the right place? See the name on the door? This podcast is spine chillers and serial killers. Surely you don't want to come in here. You do. Well, I must warn you that things are pretty adult in here. Absolutely no children are allowed. Obscene language, shocking and horrendous stories to chill you to your core, and terrifying tales that'll keep you up at night. The ladies inside aren't quite right. Lovely and hilarious, but very... strange. Still want in, do you? Well, you'll get what you're here for. Listener discretion is advised. This week's Fine Chillers and Serial Killers. I'm Tash. I'm Emma. And I'm Becky. I forgot which order. <laughs> I nearly waved. I did another salute again. I went... <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I caught myself. How <laughs> are you gorgeous girlies? I'm all right. <laughs> I'm oh, convinced. Okay. I've, I've got some news. Oh? oh let's, let's have it. I'm fine. So let's go. I'm afraid that I've got a new best friend. And you two have been demoted. Excuse me? <laughs> We've both said the same thing, so outraged. Excuse me? Who is this person? I went on a lovely little weekend away with my nan this weekend, took her away for her birthday. Oh, uh, well, I was forgiven, it's your nan, because how did it go? I've made a new friend called Audrey. Oh, yes, I saw the story with Audrey. I miss her. Oh. I just, I miss Audrey, okay? <laughs> Did you not exchange numbers? It didn't feel right. Oh. <laughs> She's about 90. Oh. <laughs> but I very much enjoyed our swim together. Oh, bless you. Some people are just lovely. How long were you away? How many nights? I was away for three nights. Three nights. Yeah. Explain what you were doing. So I took my nan away. She was turning 84. She had said to me last year how she didn't think she'd ever go away again. Oh. And I said, I'll take you away. So we booked a Warner Leisure holiday, which is an adult only trip. So I did think that the majority of the people there would be elderly. What I didn't anticipate was that I would be the youngest person there apart from the staff by about 30 years. <laughs> that nobody else would be there like me with their elderly parents or their grandparents i i don't know um so yeah it was full of old people but i had a lovely time played old lots of quizzes work, though i love I'll old tell people you what, they're on that dance floor <laughs> they're doing the li- they did the line dancing and i tell you what's really cute is that Our generation don't really do this, but they learn dances. They're doing like proper dance routines. Yeah. Like, oh, and it was so lovely to watch. Like, it did really warm my heart. And then um, on the second night, I just got really drunk. With your nan? But what? She doesn't know that I was drunk. (laughs) And I was just like sat there. Like, She's not listening to this. It's fine. You don't need to whisper. Yeah, but I was... Yeah. Shh. Oh, shh. Tell Nan. Like, tell Tasha's Nan. <laughs> I sat there like deadpan like this. Like, I kept going to the bar and getting like double shots of tequila. Oh, that'll do it. Oh, my God. As well as the drink that I was then taking back to the table, which... I'm just on water now, I'm just on water. Well, I told her it was water and I told, so I said, oh, it's just sparkling water and it it was vodka. (laughs) Don't tell the nan. But I'd also got some tinnies. I had some tins of, you know, you can get mixer tins where it's like vodka and whatever, like soda or whatever. I, I got some of those and was drinking them in my room before I even went down to dinner. Well, Tash. So. Is that how you met your friend? She was like, 
oh, I've got, I've got, she's got a little handbag with a little tap dispenser. She's like dispensing vodka. <laughs> Yeah, oh, my God, that's a good idea for the next time. Yes. I did need that sauna, though. I did need to steam out that alcohol the next day because then, actually, I think the worst part was pretending that I wasn't hung over the next day when actually I just felt so disgusting and just had to cheerily play quizzes and toss the beanbag like I wasn't wanting to vomit. <laughs> toss off the beanbag. The beanbag. <laughs> oh, yeah. you know what? When when you were showing me a few things, I was really jealous. I really wanted to go. <laughs> it looks amazing. It looks lovely. I really want to cute. take my nan somewhere. <laughs> do you know what? I think it's a lovely thing to do. Like it's not the kind of trip we'd go on together. Yeah. But if you want to take an elderly relative, like it's perfect because you can do as little or as much as you want like there is a pool there so like my nan went back and had a rest for a few hours and I went for a swim I went and got a massage while she was resting like yeah it was just really cute we did some quizzes we played board games we drank lots of tea and then she stayed up and listened to the music so we danced um to Queen as the clock stroked midnight struck Struck. It didn't stroke. Stroke. Didn't no, stroke it. Stroke. Okay. <laughs> midnight. You As sexy the clock devil. struck midnight. midnight on her birthday, we were dancing to Queen. Which one? We are the champions. Oh, you are. You're a champion granddaughter, is what you are. You are. Wow. What a lovely granddaughter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. I try hard. So if anyone wants to come with us, we're going again next year. So if anyone wants to bring their elderly grandmother or grandfather on a little trip, get in contact. We'll do it together and then we'll have company as well. Yeah, yeah. I love how you stocked your mini fridge in the room. <laughs> it was like a proper supermarket shop had gone in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Luckily, the Tesco's was like two minutes away. Oh. So, uh Word and structure up. Did you take your nan's like little trolley wheelie thing that old people have? Should have done. What are they called? Trolleys. Well, just wheelie, a little trolley, wheelie, isn't yeah. it? Wheelie trolley or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think all trolleys wheel by default, don't they? Um, yes, all right. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> trolleys wheel while midnight gets stroked. <laughs> 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 my new motto that needs to go on a t-shirt <laughs> yeah you want to wear a t-shirt where everybody's like what the fuck does that mean <laughs> great conversation was, starter yeah. actually you should listen to this podcast yeah, yeah. <laughs> full of great phrases and sayings just like this <laughs> i'll tell you what still is a great conversation starter is my favourite dating question. Oh, the bacon and the feet thing. The bacon and the pork chop. It's still a great one and it still gets people chatting. Did you use it on Audrey? I didn't use it on Audrey. I um, I think Audrey thought I worked there, to be honest. <laughs> oh, bless Audrey. <laughs> I took her into the locker room and everything. I was like, this is how the locker works. And I was like, you can dry your towel here after. And... She went to use a shower and I went, oh, Audrey, don't. They're very cold. You're best off using it back in your room. And she did 20 laps. Go on, Audrey. Trooper. Go on, Audrey. Yeah. I like that I name. I was proud of her. She had a lovely little cap on. Oh, stop it. She was just, oh, she was the cutest. Oh, bless her. Little, uh... I love old people so much. Yeah, Aww. they can be really wholesome, can't they? Did you see any of them complaining? Because that's really funny as well. <laughs> <laughs> what they did complain about, and it did really make me chuckle, was that the plates weren't warm. Oh, and it's so on the buffet. Obviously, it's a buffet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but I definitely think that's an old person thing to complain about. I would never complain about that. I would complain about many, many things, but not warm plates. Like... I, I wouldn't complain about it just because I don't complain generally. Oh, I but do. I would think internally cold plates it's shitty do you warm your plates at home no fuck no but if i'm out i want a warm plate but i just think by the time it's got back it's cold anyway my mum used to warm our plates so maybe that's where i'm getting it from. i think she it's always, a generational thing she always used to put the plates in the oven before dinner no no 
Yeah. I'm like mid spoon of the mashed potato. Where where are the plates? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Talking about interesting ways to get people listening to our podcast. Go on. Talk to me, baby. Someone out there is doing something right. I think our listeners are sharing us and telling their colleagues and friends and family because we went from the top 10% of global podcasts to the top 5%. Woo! Woo! So not top five. Top 5%. Which top 5%. we're 95% better than everyone else. Fuck! Yeah. <laughs> no one that wants. Maths. <laughs> 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 Pulling an imaginary horn there. Honk, honk. <laughs> honk, honk. <laughs> Did you used to do that past like lorries? Yeah, but on the bus. <laughs> and then you'd get it, you'd do it and you'd be like, yeah. yeah. Like the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah go us and thank you so much to anybody who has ever shared or spoken about or um or just generally you know spread the word because you're doing a good job yeah thank you guys we thank do you. really appreciate it keep on sharing keep on talking about us and maybe just maybe we'll be rich one day mm. or, or make any money whatsoever yeah <laughs> That'd, that'd be nice. <laughs> I think you've got to be like in the top 0.01%. I'm going to say at least the top 1%. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. yeah. Or in the top 20 of this particular type of podcast. But we can get there. We could I... get there. We could get there. So we were going to do a new segment this week, Tash. Apparently so. Yeah. But I'll be honest, can hardly remember the conversation. <laughs> But luckily, one of us did remember. Yay, Becky! Yeah. And it was, it was me for once, the one that forgets everything. So do you want to remind me what my segment is meant to be? We were talking about it. You said it was you as well, I think, that was like, we need to do a segment of just like gross things and oh. occasionally like a wholesome one. I think it was me. And... So I think it was Emma. There we are. Okay. But anyway, so... um, But the ne- the day after we recorded that one... This story popped up on like TikTok or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's perfect for the gross section. I'll keep it. Well, let's hear it then. This is so gross. Oh. Oh. Oh, I feel really sick. That's a no from me. It's disgusting. Oh. Are you ready? It's not very long. It's just a little tit bit. Oh, I love a tit. <laughs> love a bit of tit. Is it tit? Oh. Is it tit bit or tid bit? Tit bit. Yeah, I've always said tit bit. Like what you give a dog, isn't it? What, a tit? <laughs> tit bit. You give a dog a tidbit, don't you? Yeah. Here, dog. <laughs> Have a tidbit. <laughs> oh, that's gross. <laughs> there you go. That's the segment done. It's gross. <laughs> Breastfeeding your dog. <laughs> so it's, it's a little segue into the gross stuff. Since 2005, at a golf course in southwest Norway, there is someone that goes and poops in the golf holes. Every <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> um, so the person sneaks onto the golf course at night. It only happens on weekdays. Sneaks onto the golf course at night and does takes a dump in the golf holes and leaves like toilet paper nearby. So he has wipe. Do people realize before the ball goes in? I, th- I don't know. I, th- that's, I it, think that's the thing. It's now got to be somebody's job every morning to check, check. which one he's shitting. Yeah. Oh. Thing is, though, why? I imagine like, I'm sorry, I can't poop at home. I can only poop Pooping in the golf, golf holes. holes. <laughs> <laughs> so they're short. Well, this is the bit that I don't agree with. They're sure it's a man because it's the poos are too big to be a woman's. That means nothing. Because 
my four-year-old, I swear, poops bigger than me. So it just it just depends. I don't poo, I'm a lady. <laughs> Gosh, Jane. You're not a lady, my tequila-loving friend. <laughs> so they think it's a man. So what they did was they installed security cameras to try and catch the pooper in the act. And he shat on them. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't. But when he was shimmy on into his favourite poop spot one night, because he had holes that he preferred. Yeah. He had favourite poo in We holes. all have a favourite hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, so they put up cameras <laughs> and floodlights um floodlights <laughs> yeah <laughs> trying to catch him this poor pet he just wants to have a poo leave him alone let's not he's shitting in holes where people put their put their hands on purpose every day of the week oh wait no hold on a second so they pl- applied for a permit to put up cameras but were denied so i don't know how he could be denied to put up cameras on a golf course it must just be like a rule thing. But so what they do is, is they installed these floodlight things that get tripped by motion, but like motion, motion sensors. And what the person did, they were so determined to keep pooing in the holes that they actually shimmied up the tree near where the, the lights were and they broke, they like disconnected the lights so that they could go and poo in peace in the dark like they loved. This is <laughs> so much effort for a shit. I know. And imagine doing that when you're desperate for a shit. Yeah, turtlenecking. I'm turtle I can barely walk when sometimes you try to like run in and then you have to stop and just kind of hope for the best. The person who is pooing in these holes is still at large. The theory is they really don't like golf. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so whether I wonder if they live nearby and they keep getting their windows smashed or something like that no I just think they it's the thrill of doing it and not being caught yeah getting a so kick. what they think is someone that hates the game of golf or that it could be like a fetish it's a fetish isn't it they get off thinking yeah. someone's going to touch their poo there we go I think yeah. that was a good first that's gross segment that's great yeah I'm afraid it <laughs> Lots of the gross things that are probably going to end up being poo. But, yeah. Pooping yeah. in golf holes. Shall we move on from shit? Oh, we we owe you an apology, Becky. Yeah. Because oh. after reviewing that clip of you moving your eye... It moved slightly. It wasn't amazing, <laughs> but it did move. It, a tiny bit. No, we didn't have to talk about that again. I, I was willing to forget it. <laughs> But no, because we were taking the piss, saying, you can't do it. And you did do we it. We were so horrible. <laughs> it was so funny, you though. Were, I can't. And we were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I forgive you. I but it turns out you can. So I deeply well apologise. It was very <laughs> funny, though, watching you try. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's so hard to do something when, you know, when you're smiling, laughing, and then you've got a big light in your face. So, My mum literally yeah. was like to me, Becky can do it. I was like, no, she can't. People Bore ringing off. you up in the middle of the night. She Becky was like, yeah, she it. can. I could see her on the video. I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I know. People were straight to her defence. I had one person go, oh, how do you do that? That's amazing. And I was like, oh, kiss ass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's weird. She's weird. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're going to go on another spooky series. this story i'm only halfway through the book i know the story and i'm reading the book to get all the juicy details for you guys i was reading the book about halfway through and i actually started freaking out you know when you're so scared you're like what's that what's that and you're hearing all these weird noise like Like a little cat like yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's like one o'clock in the morning and i was like ben ben Ben, wake up. How do you sleep when I am scared? <laughs> wake up. And he was like, what's the matter? I was like, listen. He was like, there's nothing happening. Like, yes, listen. And he- Every time you speak, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the book freaked me out. And so- he's like, well, you woke me up. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so it should be quite scary. Hopefully my door over there won't open randomly. And I don't have my kids tonight, so no one should walk in. 
No little humans. Oh, if someone does, then we then. Oh yeah, that's not mine. <laughs> then we panic. Be afraid. Then uh, yeah, call the police, please. Johnny Hewling, a 17-year-old farmhand living in Kentucky, was just going about his daily business on February 1st, 1896. He stumbled upon a horrific sight, the headless body of a woman. She was soon identified as being Pearl Bryan from a tag in her shoes. Pearl was 22 at the time of her death and was a Sunday school teacher from Indiana. God, so young, isn't it? 22, mm. is no age. It's shocking. Mind you, in 1896, isn't that like middle aged? Middle aged. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like 50. <laughs> Bless her. The coroner who examined her found her to have multiple wounds to her back and hands. She had copious amounts of cocaine in her system and she was five months pregnant. And just when you thought wow. things couldn't be more horrific, the coroner stated that Pearl had been decapitated while still alive. How do they know? The amount of blood, I think. Blood coagulation and stuff, I imagine. That's horrible. Bless her. With a small, sharp object. Oh. So it wasn't even quick? No. A little oh, like a machete. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to have your head cut off, you kind of want it off, don't you? Not. Mm. Poor love. I think this is more like scalpely. <sighs> It feels like a lot of effort as well. Like, well, yeah. The investigation very soon led to a man called Scott Jackson, a dental student from Ohio College of Dental Surgery. He and Pearl had been having a secret relationship over the past several months, and he very quickly admitted to the murder, also naming his roommate Alonzo M. Walling as his accomplice. Okay. At least he came forward and dobbed in his mate well yeah well he, he was also guilty i mean snitches get stitches but yeah when jackson had learned about pearl's pregnancy he had convinced her to have an abortion as they weren't married and a baby would create a scandal and ruin both of their reputations pearl traveled over to visit him telling people she was just visiting a friend for a few days Jackson and his roommate first tried to kill the baby using cocaine, so that's why she had so much cocaine in her system. But being unsuccessful, they decided with their very limited knowledge of human anatomy, anatomy. I can never say that word, anatomy, and equipped with their dentistry tools to perform the abortion themselves. Now, how they ended up deciding that actually butchering her repro reproductive organs was not enough and that they should cut her head off instead is unknown. But that is indeed how it ended for Paul Pearl Bryan and her unborn child. Baby. Aww. Can you imagine how fucking horrific? You're letting your boyfriend butcher you down there anyway with all his drills and fuck knows what. What I don't understand as well is surely a murder is a worse a scandal than... Yeah. I was literally just about to say that. There's a theory. You'll see a bit further down. We get back to Jackson and um, Mr. Whaling that they were not quite right in the head. And the oh, fact yeah. that they'd right. started slicing, cutting, blood, they were like, oh... Shall we take this to the next level type? We like, yeah, we like what we're seeing. Yeah. Oh, God. Both Jackson and Whaling were convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to death. They were hanged on the 20th of March, 1897. And according to reports, their necks did not break as intended when they fell. So they both were left to hang for several minutes before suffocating. Wailing's last words were that he would haunt this land forever as he thought his execution was unjust. I'm not sure it was. So he's the roommate that's got caught up in all of this. So he basically just thought, you know, he shouldn't hang for it. And Well, because it wasn't his idea. <laughs> yeah. That's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to do it. <laughs> Well, he told me to do it. If he <laughs> just needs someone swooping in, if he told you to jump off a cliff, <laughs> would you do it? <sighs> now, we're going to jump oh, back dear. a little bit to 1850 at 44 Licking Pike. Licking Pike? Yeah. 
44 Lick, okay. Licking Pike, Wilder, Kentucky. There stood a large slaughterhouse that supplied the area with beef. Now, obviously, this is the mid 1800s, so there's not exactly any hate, health and safety laws. So all the blood and guts from the animals was dumped directly into a well in the slaughterhouse's basement. Yeah, standard. The well fed into the river licking. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? My story has a really weird name in the town as well that I was like, no, that's not the real name. <laughs> so this isn't finished. It's called, do you want to know what it's called? Yeah. The, the town? Bear Knob. Bear Knob. Bear Knob. Bear Knob. Not Bald Knob. Bald Knob. <laughs> <laughs> Which is worse. I mean, put them together, licking Bear Knob and yeah, have a great ba- night. Bear, bald Knob, the river licking, heading towards the Bald Knob. <laughs> right, come on. Let's get down to business. So the well fed into the river licking that would run red every time they dumped the body parts and blood. Oh, oh, how terrifying. Imagine just like walking down the river. And it's just like... I'm seeing it go all blood. Yeah. Oh. Seeing oh, no so- wonder they, they, when they saw weird stuff like that happen. It's just like randomly visiting the area and see like a river fill it with blood. No wonder they... Like, believed in loads of stuff back then. Yeah, gross. Oh, dear, I bet that stank. The slaughterhouse ran for 40 years and then closed for unknown reasons. It stood empty for several years, or so people thought. It had, in fact, become the meeting place for a satanic group to perform their rituals. Oh, lovely. Well, it seems like the perfect place, right? Yeah, yeah rivers of blood and yeah. stuff. Throwing the bodies of the small animals they would sacrifice down the well as an offering to Satan himself. Now, can we guess who was part of this satanic sect? Was it the two dentists? It was indeed. Pearl Bryan's murderers, Scott Jackson and Alonzo Whaling. Now, of course, we've got no proof of this, but it is entirely possible that the two men threw Pearl's head down the well after her demise as a satanic ritual and would explain why her head was never found. The slaughterhouse was torn down in the 1920s and a roadhouse was built in its place. During Prohibition, it became a secret bar in a casino called the Primrose and it was insanely popular. But this caught mobsters' attention. I'd love to be a mobster's wife. We know this. And they started to want to take over and get their share of the profits. But the owner, Buck Brady, never gave in to them. This caused him and his staff to be the victims of death threats, fights and attempted murders. In the 1950s, Buck grew tired of the constant threat of violence and sold the Primrose to the mobsters, who turned it into a nightclub called the Latin Quarter. And not to break tradition, the land would yet again be the site of a terrible tragedy. Oh no. Oh no. A young dancer called Joanna worked at the Latin Quarter. She fell madly in love with a singer called Robert Randall. She became pregnant with his baby, and when her father found out, he had Robert murdered. Heartbroken and grief-stricken, Joanna tried to poison her father. It's unclear whether she was successful or not, but afterwards she killed herself in the basement of the nightclub. Her body was found laying dead next to the building's well. So that where they used to pour all the blood and everything. She was Uh, five months pregnant. Oh, two. Interesting. After the bosses of the Latin Quarter were arrested multiple times for gambling, it was shut down and was replaced by a hard rock cafe. I did see that there was probably a brief time that it was a bowling alley, but afterwards it was a hard rock cafe. And again, was often the site of violence, drug use and even murders. Which you don't really think of when you think of the Hard Rock Cafe, do you? No. But No. I think of guitars on the wall. 
Yeah, well. <laughs> think of the hoodie that I have in my closet. Did you get it when you went to America? Yes. I had to because then I had to show everyone that I've been there. Yeah, I obviously. Yuck. <laughs> in fact, the amount of fatal shootings that occurred during these years are what got the Hard Rock Cafe closed down by law enforcement in 1978. So this site isn't having much luck really is it no no it's not doing well in the spring of 1978 bobby and janet mackey drove up to this enormous building bobby was buzzing he was really excited to buy it and turn it into a honky-tonk bar he'd fallen in love with it when he'd visited it with an estate agent and now was so excited to show his wife janet the whole potential of the place What's a honky-tonk bar? It's like country music, I think. Oh, is it? I think I so. I do lion dancing. Yeah, I think that's, that, that's it, really. So you have to take your nan next. <laughs> Janet looked at the run-down, almost dilapidated building and her heart sank. Ignoring the foreboding feeling it was given off, she was four months pregnant and this looked like an enormous project that she just didn't think they should take on. But she also knew her husband. He was a kind man but extremely stubborn and if his mind was made up about this place, there would be no changing it. Bobby Mackey was a well-known country singer and hadn't had any intention to open up a nightclub until he had seen 44 Licking Pike advertised. The building had almost called out to him and now here they were, him looking like a little boy on Christmas morning and Janet fighting every fibre in her body telling her not to go inside. Nearly five months pregnant too. As she stared at the building, a metal door swung open. She gasped and asked Bobby if he'd seen it. He just chuckled and said, well there must be somebody in there and told her not to be so on edge. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about the doors opening by themselves. Yeah, I mean, that's just like pure horror film, isn't it? The, yeah. Just the door going, come in. Yeah. Well, it's the beginning of our podcast, isn't it? Creaky door. Oh, yeah. yes. Doopy doopy doo. The pair entered and Bobby shouted, hello, is anyone there? But his question was met with dead silence. The place was empty. Who opened the door then, asked Janet. Oh, probably the ghost, her husband replied jokingly. (laughs) Wanker. He ushered her further inside and began showing her around. Every step of the way, Janet was getting more and more afraid. She didn't know why, but the whole place just felt wrong. She felt like there were eyes watching her from every shadowy corner. Bobby had wandered off into another room and she heard him shout, Hey, lady, wait, lady, stop. She went over to him and asked who he was talking to, but he said he must have been imagining it. There was no one there. He had been imagining the dance floor full and bustling with people having the time of their lives when he saw a woman dressed in white walk across the room. Where did she go? asked Janet. Oh, she just vanished into the shadows, he answered. Don't worry, I was definitely just daydreaming. It's not really how daydreaming works, is it? (laughs) No, that's just just people vanishing into the shadows. It's just daydreaming, don't worry. (sighs) Janet wasn't so sure about that. Janet's on it. But knew better than to keep talking about it. Bobby was very down to earth and definitely did not believe in ghosts. She said she wanted to go, so they began making their way to the door when all the lights flickered on and off. Faulty switches, suggested Bobby. As Janet looked back for one last glimpse inside, she saw two demonic red eyes peering back at her from the darkness. She blinked and they were gone. Janet absolutely hated this place and never really wanted to step foot in there again. Janet is cool. Janet is sensible. Yeah, Janet is my grand's name, so I like Janet. Oh, your nan's lovely. Her worries about Bobby being stubborn were valid, as he did indeed buy the building. What a twat. And the couple got to work as soon as they had the keys. Everything needed painting and cleaning, and there was lots of stuff that needed to be taken away to be dumped. It was a mammoth task. 
Janet's feelings about the place had not changed and she still felt extremely uncomfortable inside, but tried to ignore it and get on with stuff. One afternoon, as the couple were cleaning, a man appeared in the doorway. Janet saw him first and called over Bobby. The man introduced himself as Carl Lawson, saying he'd heard about the new owners and being an old employee from the previous two owners, he thought he'd come and see if they needed a hand. He said he knew everything there was to know about the building and he would be a great asset to the couple. No, I don't trust him. Bobby immediately liked this guy and handed him a broom, saying he was hired and he could start work straight away. Handed him a broom? Sorry, that geezer's really sold himself and all he's worth is a broom. (laughs) Yeah, but that's what they're doing at the minute. They're just cleaning. They're just getting it ready for opening. Granted, he could have passed him the hoover. <laughs> yeah, and then, I don't know, I just don't like it. He's just like, hey, I can, I, I, I know everything. And he's like, my man, and just like gives him yeah, a Yeah, but you do need someone in a building like that. You do need somebody that knows the way the building works. So I think... But isn't doesn't a building work in the fact that the building's a building and just needs no. to be there? No. But Carl knows where all the fuse boxes are and stuff. There's always like n- things, isn't there? Like a door that doesn't open right or... I don't know. He seemed, he seemed a bit too keen for my liking. We shall see anyway. Bobby then walked off to keep cleaning, leaving Janet alone with Carl. He begins telling Janet how he had seen people get murdered here. But she shouldn't worry about the ghosts. They're his friends. He's a creep. (laughs) I've attracted everything I said. Yeah. Oh, I've seen people get murdered here, but it's fine. No bad bad juju has been left by the murders. (laughs) You've just met someone. You've just hired them and they're like, I saw someone get murdered. I'll be honest, though. My favourite thing about working at the hotel was all the weird stories that we all told each other. Yeah, but, like, did you do it on the first day? Always. Oh, Yeah, okay. you give people the gossip on the first day. I don't know, but did you give it to them whilst swinging a room around and, like, and like saying that you're friends with ghosts? Yeah. I didn't say that, no. Okay. Don't worry about the ghosts. They're my friends. They're friends. Hey. Oh, dear. That was horrible, Emma. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> She didn't know how to respond and, well, fair enough. How do you respond to that? (laughs) Just like, oh. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. (laughs) That's nice. (laughs) (laughs) You know that Homer Simpson gif where he just kind of slowly backs away? (laughs) (laughs) So she kind of just weakly smiled and went to carry on her cleaning even though her heart had just sunk right to the pit of her stomach. Carl, too, began to sweep and clean, and without realising that Janet was still watching, he looks up to the ceiling and whispers, I'm back. I promise I won't leave again. Do you think he's a ghost? Well, I know the story, so it wouldn't be fair for me to... (laughs) Yeah. Give any I can give you the right answers. (laughs) Oh, and also, why is everyone that's called Carl a fucking weirdo in your stories? Weird. Have we ever had a normal Carl? Coral. It was <laughs> Carl with his plane. Oh, I miss Carl. No, you don't. Nobody misses fucking Carl. <laughs> Jesus Christ, We've woman. not mentioned him in a while, though. Yeah. He has to have an honorary mention every now and again. Elena, your sister is here. <laughs> <laughs> that haunts me that does your sister turning Sorry, up you need to go and listen to Carl Tanzler episode to know what we're on about but when his sister turns up where's my sister and he goes oh Elena your sister is here fucking horrible A horrible mental man back to Janet and Carl yeah this Carl different Carl Different so Carl. Janet was terrified at hearing what Carl had just announced to the building. She knew something was very off here, and now here was this guy talking to his ghost friends. The deep sensation of dread 
was almost unbearable. And you know that she's going to go and act, tell her husband, and her husband is just going to brush it off. He's like cool. That broom. Carl's cool. Like, he knows the building. We need him. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. He knows where the fuses are. Yeah, exactly. A few days later, Carl went off to tidy up. Janet tried to move to go and do some cleaning herself, but found she couldn't move her legs. They'd become heavy as lead. She tried calling out, but nothing came out. She tried moving her arms, couldn't do it. She felt something coming closer and closer, but she couldn't see anything. And then she heard a whisper right in her ear. Get out. Ah! Oh, that's literally just made me go cold all over. Yeah. I could just see that in the horror film. Just get out. And then it'd be like, bing, 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 bing. The music. Janet Horrible. was petrified, but still unable to move. Oh. She would indeed get out if she was able to. In fact, she would love nothing more. Get out, came the voice again, louder this time. And then she saw it, a ladder, a few feet away, began to topple back and forth and slowly turn to face her direction. Janet thought, this is it. That ladder was going to fly at her and there was nothing she could do about it. She couldn't move to protect herself or her unborn baby. Carl was in another room but he smelt a familiar scent, the smell of roses. Oh, God, he thought, it's happening again. Come on, Carl, come and help. And he rushed to make sure Janet and Bobby were okay. Just as he arrived towards Janet, he saw the ladder flying towards her and he grabbed her and moved her out of its path, saving her from serious injury. Well done, Carl. If not worse. Maybe I judged you too quickly. Janet was shaken, to say the least. She stared at Carl and said, you and I need to have a chat. It was time he told her all that he knew. Carl sat down nervously. This was either going to go well or he would get fired and sent to the loony bin. He began explaining that a few years back he was alone in the building cleaning. It was closed and all the doors were locked. So he he knew no one was inside when he turned to see a woman. His heart nearly jumped out of his chest at the sight, asking what she was doing. She apparently giggled like a child. (laughs) Oh, that's horrible. And said she was waiting for her love, Robert Randall, to come and get her. Janet was stunned. Her husband's real name was Robert Randall Mackey. Everyone just called him Bobby for short. She asked him what this woman looked like and his description fit perfectly to the woman that Bobby had supposedly imagined the first time he had showed Janet the building. She kept that to herself and let Carl carry on the story. The ghost had told him about her father who had killed her fiancé and so she had committed suicide right there in the basement. Carl said that he thought she was some crazy lady and walked over to ring the police but when he turned around again she'd vanished. He continued to say that he sensed her a few times after that, always first by smelling the scent of roses, but he never saw her again. He admitted one time being drunk and hearing, beware of the evil that hides inside, and then hearing a woman saying, don't hurt this man. He admitted to not understanding what the message meant, but saying that that's how he knew Janet was in trouble. Just now he'd smelled the same familiar smell of fresh roses. Carl said he remembered hearing that her name is Joanna. Janet was confused at what, at why a seemingly harmless ghost would want to throw a ladder at her. Carl didn't think it was her, but more that she was trying to warn him that some other entity was up to no good. And that's probably why it was more of a get out than a get out. Yeah. Yeah, like, I'm warning you, and look, here's a ladder. Yeah. Janet decided to tell Bobby about the attack and the ghosts, but she knew it wouldn't go down well. Bobby thought it was all a load of rubbish, and a huge argument ensued. Why would they argue about that? 
because she wanted him to sell it. She was like, let's fuck off. And he, yeah. and he's a bit let's like, you out. didn't want me to buy this. It's just excuses. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd get Carl involved. I bet Carl was like, I don't get involved in um, couples fights. No, because Carl was there and Janet was like, Carl, go and do something else. She go sweep. To involve You're really him, good like. at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bit sweeping. Yeah. The next attack, I mean, in all fairness, this building is huge and it's filthy. So all they've got to do is clean and paint. That's, that's literally all they're doing. Okay. The next attack was also aimed at poor Janet. It seemed that whatever was haunting the soon-to-be Bobby Mackey's music world did not like her at all. She was cleaning that day with Carl. See, they're at it again. Sweep in. They decided to hit the kitchen as it was a massive mess. As they began, they both heard a moaning sound coming from underneath their feet from the basement. The moaning was then joined by voices whispering all at once, things that neither Carl nor Janet could make out. Then screaming, hideous, tormented screaming filled the kitchen, followed by a sinister laugh. Janet shouted, leave us alone, and everything stopped. The pair exchanged terrified looks, and then they heard every single door in the basement opening and slamming shut one after the other. Carl had had enough and said he was going to go down and check it out, despite Janet's pleas with him not to. He did just that and left her stood terrified in the kitchen as he went to investigate the basement. Janet decided to keep herself busy by sweeping, cleaning, yeah, and turn the tap on. Brown, dirty water sprayed out for a while till it ran clean. Yeah. You know, when a tap hasn't been Yeah, old towels. Yeah. She started to fill up a bucket, only to see the water turn into some kind of thick, black substance. Ooh. The entire room filled with a stench of piss and sweat. She tried to run away, but she found herself trapped by an unseen presence holding her around the waist, pressing down hard as if it was deliberately trying to hurt her baby. She screamed out for Carl and the thing squeezed her tighter and began swinging her around the room. Then she felt hands around her neck and thought once more that she was going to die. She was lifted up off her feet by the neck and forced to walk towards a sink of black slime. As her head got closer and closer to the goo, the lights began flickering on and off, almost as if the ghost was trying to add dramatic effects that was very much unneeded. Carl shouted, Janet, I'm coming! And as his words echoed through the building, whatever was attacking Janet slinked back into the wall and vanished. Janet and Carl stood for a second in pure silence, just staring at each other in absolute terror. Before anyone had time to speak, a tremendous banging resonated all around them, and then the voices returned and that horrible, demonic laughter. They both ran out of the building, scared out of their wits. I don't think you should come back for a while, said Carl. Janet didn't take too much convincing. Bobby pulled up and Janet jumped straight in the car and asked to be taken home. Bobby could tell she was upset, but when she said it was because of the building, he didn't know what to reply as he simply just didn't believe in ghosts. He worried what could be wrong with his wife. She'd never acted this way before. He just assumed it was the pregnancy getting to her and left it at that. End of part one. I think she needs to leave him and get with Carl. At least he knows what, what's happening. Yeah. Carl knows what, all right. Carl knows what's happening, but he's come back. Whispering, I am back. Yeah, little. Carl's. Yeah, there's, there's, there's layers to things. There's stuff that we've got to get into next week. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. I'm not sold on Carl, but for now. Mm. So there you go. Part one of Bobby's... Part one. Part one of Combien? Two, I imagine. Oh, two. Bobby Thanks, Mackey's Bye. Music World. Yeah. That was very good, though. I'm very excited. Randomly, have you guys watched Saltburn? Yeah. Oh, I wondered when we were going to talk about this. I thought we'd already spoken no, about it. because ever since that, I've had that... It's murder on the dance floor. 
I'm Benefit. so sick of that fucking song. Like, I'm really, really pleased that Sophie Ellis Bexter is making a fucking killing again. Yes. But please, can we just stop with that song? See, they haven't, they haven't I don't know if you've been playing it on the radio or whatever, where you are. They they haven't it's here, or especially not everywhere. on the stupid radio station we have to listen to at work that only plays French songs. Um, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. No, so I haven't really, I haven't really heard it. And it's just, uh, it's been in my head ever since I watched it like a month ago. What was your favourite scene? <laughs> like I don't know, none. I don't know the, the, the favorite. I don't think there was the a favorite. favorite I'm like, oh yeah, let's watch that one again. I did appreciate the last scene where he dances through the house. That's kind of like it's it's sinister, and I like I like I like what little bit of male nudity. You know what? <laughs> I I um I've got to say, I respect the man. He played the longest fucking game ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think spoiler, spoiler alert, spoiler. Yeah, no, no. That's it. That's all I'm gonna say. He just played a really long game. Mm. You know, everybody was on about his cock. Like they were saying how well endowed he was. Yeah, he is. I can honestly say I do not remember saying, seeing his cock. I no. was just watching, pulling this face. Like, what the fuck did I just watch? What? Just oh, trying like, to understand. The film. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, it is a weird one, isn't it? Just a bit. Yeah, just a bit. I think, you know, when you get to, spoiler alert, shagging somebody's grave. I I must admit, I had to fast forward that. I was cringing I, too hard. I, I didn't I, I enjoy that bit. No. The other, the, the the other scenes I was, I, I mean, the bathwater's fucking gross. I, I was like, my no! Skin. What? Skin in the bathwater. That's, like ooh. skin dead skin or like poo particles like t- it was the sperm that no th- like the sperm whatever but like the poo particles <laughs> and the take dead sperm sp- i take sperm in my bath water any day but yeah poo and yeah dirty but like feet. how often is that bath cleaned because i i mean i rinse my bath but i don't wash it every day i don't know they had no. like a full staff so i assumed it was clean yeah, but still i mean come on it just too much the shagging of the grave i did think was one step too far but other than that i thought great film it is a good film it is a good film should i just get on with my um story now maybe back in 1995 11-year-old Lacey Phillips was living with her mum, Mary, her dad, James, and her two older siblings, 14-year-old brother, Jesse, and her 17-year-old sister, Darla. They all lived together in their family home in the small town of Bald Knob, Arkansas. <laughs> Lovely Bald Knob. God, that, that was horrible. What? No, no, I do weird things all the time. We can keep a few of yours in. You can see the differences. You say bald knob, and I'm like, Ooh. and Tasha's on it. Like, Get it in here. <laughs> I love me some bald yeah. cock. <laughs> Give me some spermy bath water along with the bald cock. <laughs> Call it a <laughs> night. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Come in my bath. <laughs> Come in. Only if it's clean. <laughs> Come in my bath. And no one's actually been in the water. <laughs> Do you mean clean before or after? What I'm saying is that I don't think the sperm in the bath is the worst part of the dirty water. I think the fact that someone has sat in it <laughs> with their naked body, poo particles and skin and like scum from the bath oh, scum. is also in that water. <laughs> Why didn't I think scum actually it? It so scum. I actually think that sperm is the least of anyone's worries. Sperm would make the scum worse. Oh my god, why am I gonna be sick? <laughs> you know, when he said scum, I thought of sea scum, sea, sea foam. You know that stuff that you get on the beach yeah. sometimes. <sighs> yeah. And soap, like, oh. Oh, do you wanna know what I did? 
<laughs> did you sperm in the bath? <laughs> I don't know if we want to know what you did the other day. <laughs> So my daughter was really sick and she had a high fever and I got her in the bath and we have a massive bath and she wanted me to get in with her. So I got in with her and uh, she was feeling better and she was making bath soup. I'm sure loads of kids do this with the bubbles. They put it in a pot. Yeah. So she made this bath soup. You didn't drink it, did you? And she goes, Mummy, try try this. And she's got a little plastic spoon. Did you put it in your mouth? It's it's late. (laughs) Did you forget I to pretend? Listen. Did you put it in your mouth? I just went... Like, <laughs> and then I didn't know what to do. And my daughter was just like, I was only pretending, mummy. You fucking weirdo. And I was like, bad, get the mouthwash, bad, get the mouthwash. <laughs> Fever bad. Yeah. No. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. I had sick child bath water soup. Mm, mother and child soup. <laughs> yum, yum. Look, look at t- I didn't do it on purpose, Tash. I'm not a weirdo. I'm sorry that happened to you. <laughs> Thank you. It was traumatic. I'm even sorrier that you've told us. <laughs> Tash is like, I don't know if we can be friends anymore. <laughs> Isn't it funny the things that I find disgusting, though? I mean, that was disgusting, but I literally did it without thinking. And it's weird because as a general rule, when your child says, here, mummy, eat this, don't eat it. Like, whatever it is, just as a rule. So eat it. Oh, it's like, oh. But I do do weird shit like that without... (laughs) I put the gas pour in my mouth. (laughs) That's like intrusive thoughts, though, isn't it? (laughs) And Ben was like... Did you just put the cat paw in your mouth? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then he was like, do you realise how dirty it is? And, I, <laughs> and you were like... I was like, uh-huh. I do now. Uh-huh. I do now. Thanks for that, man. I'm just going to go brush my it's teeth. It's intrusive thoughts, <laughs> the- though, isn't it? You can't help it. I did it the other day. I was at work and we have cakes at work that I have to put in the display cabinet. And as I was cutting it, the customer, there was a customer in front of me. She was like, oh, that looks delicious, isn't it? I was like, yeah, it looks so good. I just want to like go and put my face in it. And obviously I didn't put my face in it. I was like, why have I just done that? Like, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> like, I was so embarrassed. I was in my, I just want to stick my face and in I it. And I was just like, oh, and I'm, I'm just, I am just so I was so embarrassed like all day that I'd done that. All day. Oh. Right, come on. Yeah. So we've got the Phillips, Phillips family. Back in 1995, 11-year-old Lacey Phillips lives with her mum, Mary, her dad, James, and her two older siblings, 14-year-old brother, Jesse, and 17-year-old sister, Darla. They all live together in their family home in the small town of Bald Knob, Arkansas where they were described as a happy, loving, not ordinary family. On the 6th of June, 1995, Lacey was being looked after by her older sister, Darla, as it's summer break, and their mum was at work. At 4pm, Lacey had a scheduled dentist appointment, so Darla dropped Lacey at her mum's work so that her mum could take her to the dentist appointment after she'd finished. So her mum uh, worked at a local county tax office. So as she dropped her off at the office, Darla had a quick chat with her mum and said, "I'm gonna, she's going to stay at a friend's house that night and I love you, mum, see you tomorrow. And then she leaves. A few hours go by. So, yeah, so longer, longer than usual. And the dad, James, is at home and thinks, no, they're a bit late back from the dentist. Okay, we'll wait for a bit longer. So that he's there at home with their son, Jesse, because D- Darla's gone to a friend's house. And then as the hours go by, they're just getting more and more worried and they know that something's wrong because Mary would let them know if there's any problems. So as the hours pass and the sun goes down, James starts thinking the worst has happened and just calls the police. James informs the police of where Mary works where they were supposed to be at this dentist appointment and that the fact that they never returned home. So the police took their call seriously, sent some 
officers over to the house to get more more information. They sent out patrols trying to find the two. And one of the police deputies arrived at Mary's place of work, so at the tax office. He found the car park empty except for one pickup truck, which after he checked the license plate, realised that it was Mary's pickup truck. As he approached the front of the building, he saw that the front door wasn't locked, which was a massive red flag because this was a business and doors should be locked. So as he entered, his senses were like heightened. He knew instantly something was wrong. He just had a feeling. It was really dark everywhere, but with his flashlight, he began to search around. His heart sank as he stumbled upon the body of a young woman. She appeared to have been badly beaten. Her hands were bound behind her back. He rushed over and checked for signs of life, but he realised that she was deceased and had been for a few hours. Oh, God. Uh, Even for an officer with crime scene experience, the sight was shocking. And he struggled to process what he was witnessing. He immediately called for backup and he started taking photos of the crime scene without disturbing anything. So as he's going around clicking his camera, he notices a trail of blood leading to a different room. So it was leading to this other room and the door was closed. So he opened the door. It was like it led to a small bathroom. And as he was like scanning the room, he saw in the middle of the room was a a young girl tied tied to a chair, slumped over, motionless and covered in blood. Shit. It was evident that she had suffered severe head injuries from multiple blows. Assuming that she was deceased as well, just like the other victim, he started taking photos of the crime scene you know, to just document as much as possible. However, amidst the clicks of his camera, something unexpected happened. The little girl suddenly opened her eyes and turned her head towards him. She was alive. Thank fuck. So the officer was like, (gasps) you know, he just wasn't expecting that because she did not look alive. Yeah. Little Lacey was alive. Against all odds, she was still breathing and now had her eyes wide open, staring back at the officer. She asked him, Can you untie me, please? Quickly, he rushed to her side and started untying her and got her off the chair and um, called into his radio again, saying, you know, to send ambulance as well. Uh, As Lacey was rushed to a nearby hospital, her only concern was for her mother. She repeatedly asked the officer and anyone that came up to her where her mother was and if she was okay. Despite her fading in and out of consciousness, her thoughts remained fixed on her mother's safety. Upon arrival at the hospital, Lacey was immediately taken to the emergency room where doctors began to assess all of her injuries. It was evident that she had suffered severe trauma to her head and also she had signs of strangulation around her neck. The medical team worked swiftly to stabilise her and they discovered that her jaw was fractured also. Her skull would need to be reconstructed because it was that badly damaged. Fucking hell. Poor little little love. So the dad, James, who had now arrived at the hospital, was just in a state of shock you know, just 15 hours before his life was normal, whereas now his wife was gone and he could lose his daughter as well because she wasn't out of the woods yet. So as doctors fought to save Lacey's life, James could only just wait anxiously, hoping for a miracle and clinging to the hope that his daughter would pull through. The perpetrator was still on the loose. Police had like no leads, no evidence, you know, and the crime scene was still being processed at the time. However, Lacey woke up after being in surgery and after a few hours of waiting for her to recover a little bit, the police wanted to speak to her as quick as possible. So yeah, when they were cleared by doctors, they came in to ask Lacey if she remembered what happened. And it must have been like seared onto her brain because she actually remembered a lot of detail for an 11-year-old she described the her attacker really, really well, and she told them exactly what happened. 
So what happened was after Darla left that afternoon, after dropping Lacey off at her mother's workplace, Mary was finishing up her tasks and they were due just as they were about to leave to go to the dentist, a man turns up and walks into the office. So just thinking that it's uh, like another customer, they just kind of let him get on with it and ready for him to ask whatever question he needs to ask. Then they noticed that the man was wearing latex gloves and was carrying a coil of wire and a pistol. Jesus. Can you imagine seeing that and being like, well, what can I do? Just slowly like, oh, shit. Yeah. It's a horror film. So he brandished the weapon, like started waving it around and said that it was a robbery. So terrified, Mary instinctively put Lacey behind her and tried to protect her daughter. But the intruder grabbed hold of her, said, you need to come closer to me, or, you know, I'm gonna, or I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to hurt your daughter. He then bound Mary's wrists behind her back with this metal wire. Then he forced Lacey into the bathroom where he made her sit in the chair in the centre of the room. As Lacey was, like, sobbing, pleading with the man, please don't hurt my mama, please don't hurt her, that's when he callously says to her, I'm not going to hurt your mama. I'm going to hurt you. Oh, my. Oh, how horrible. That's horrendous. That's like movie evil, if you know yeah, what I mean. awful. And that's when he starts striking her in the head with the butt of his gun until she was unconscious. And he left her in that room and it was pitch black in there. An 11 year old. She's ever so diddy as well. On the, you know, you could see like pictures of what she looked like at the time and oh, little diddy little thing. It terrifies me that these people are just walking amongst us. People capable of such monstrosities. Wait until in a minute and you, you find out why this is happening. So when Lacey, not long after regaining consciousness, she found herself alone in that dark room, tied up and covered in blood. She was screaming for her mother, hoping that she was okay. However, the door then swung open. She looked up at the door thinking, oh, it's my mum. But no, it was the man again. And uh, he came into the room and strangled poor Lacey until she fell unconscious and he thought he killed her. Yeah. And then he went and beat Mary sexually assaulted her and then killed her how did he kill her oh, he beat her to death oh, jesus christ so he he thought that he killed lacy as well because he didn't want to make any noise in case he, she alerted um like a neighbor or someone outside yeah 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 and it was over 12 hours later that lacy started to come to and she could hear this clicking noise getting louder and louder and like seeing a flash and that's when she turned her head and saw the police officer and uh and was rescued that poor girl yeah beating someone to death that's horrendous and strangling because you've a got child. time i mean yeah anything yeah. to do with kids is awful beating someone to death you have got time to think the fuck maybe yeah. not a good idea yeah he'd raped her just before as well so it's just he is the like a massive piece of shit yeah. he has got to be one of the worst ones we've covered it's horrible so yeah that brings us back to where we were Lacey is in the hospital she finished speaking to the police officers and that's they let the her dad in and her dad steps up to her bed and gives her a cuddle and says uh, she doesn't know that her mum's dead, dead yet. So he said, um, you know, I, I love you and I'm sorry that mum's come to heaven with great grandma. And uh, cause it not long lost her, she not long lost her, her great grandma. And uh, she just looked at him and went, okay. You know, it just needed to go in because she'd already been yeah. through so much. And she's just, it was just like, oh, well, she's gone then. And then it gradually hit her that over the next few days, it was sinking in a bit more. I don't think when somebody tells you that one of your loved ones has passed away, I don't think that you don't you get it straight it. away. No. no, 
No, it's not something. It takes a while to sink in. It's almost like, yeah, but they haven't, have they? What can yeah. I do? What can I do to make it better? Yeah. I can yeah. I can do something here to make it go away. Yeah, but the I nurses mean, are going to save her. Personal. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. It's it just doesn't go in straight away. Your brain isn't made to be able to deal with stuff like that. No, your first reaction isn't the genuine grief stricken reaction because you're just like, no, that no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But then it's not. Yeah. And she's at 11 and just been through this terrible thing. And it's her mum. I mean, good grief. Yeah. She said that they said that, okay, but it wasn't until a few days later that the harsh reality hits Lacey that her mum is not coming back. Meanwhile, the man responsible is still at large. But she managed to describe the man in great detail to police and um, she suddenly remembers a specific feature about him, a tattoo in a certain style on his arm and the fact that he had a teardrop tattoo on his face. this before, is not he? Mm-hmm. Is that a prison tattoo? I think it means that you've killed someone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what it means, but it is to do with prison. That information gets out and they quickly link this to 31-year-old Jack Jones. And he's got the exact same teardrop tattoo and the exact same tattoo on his arm. So, yeah, they find him, bring him in. But what they didn't know when they brought him in was this man was actually also responsible for the murder of at least two other women and had been invading capture for years. Now, thanks to Lacey's testimony, police have the chance to uncover the truth and finally bring him to justice. The officer goes to his last known residence and brings Jack Jones into the police station for questioning. To the police's surprise, he actually starts talking pretty quickly, not really concealing any information about what, and he just told him what he did to Mary in a very matter-of-fact way. He said that he was walking down the street and saw Mary through the window of her office and was like, I'm going to kill her. And he went and got all of his stuff and then came back at the end of the day. It was the first day that he'd seen her. He hadn't planned it very well in advance. He'd just sort of seen her that day and was like, right, well, I'm going to kill this person. And so when he weird. came back, her daughter happened to be there. He said that he did it for revenge because the police didn't investigate his own wife's rape. So that's why he did it. Fuck off. Just fuck off. Absolute scumbag. Absolute piece of shit. Whenever the media were filming, he was like, it's because they didn't do, you know, and he was trying to tell everyone it's because they didn't investigate my wife's rape. His wife didn't officially report it. So she didn't want to press charges or she didn't want, to, didn't want it to be pursued. That's why nothing it was It wasn't done. investigated. Yes. Um, and even so... Right. And also, yeah, and also that just makes no sense. That makes it no makes sense. zero sense. You're a piece of shit. You raped and murdered somebody because you fucking wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. He thought that because he'd been done wrong, that it justified him going to do wrong to somebody else. He Doesn't didn't fucking sense. think that. He didn't fucking think That's that. That's his he excuse. Just want... Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an excuse. It's a shit excuse. But it's just a bit weird as well, isn't it? Like, he thinks that that's going to get him off. I, I just think that's how he justified it to himself. I don't think he mm. thought he was going to get out of it. Doing that to anybody, whatever excuse, you're not going to gain the sympathy of anybody. Strangling no. an 11-year-old after beating her in the head with oh, a no, gun. piece of shit. Yeah. Fuck and off. Scumbag. Police were never able to confirm whether any of his claims regarding his wife were true anyway. He probably made it up because he's a fucking lying piece of shit. Yeah. So on the 7th of June 1995, so the day after, uh, yeah. he was arrested for the rape and murder of Mary Williams and the attempted murder of young Lacey. Lacey and her father and brother kind of breathe a sigh, breathe a sigh of relief that the perpetrator is already in police custody, is not still out there. Yeah. Which helps them be able to move forward with their grief with losing Mary. But obviously the court date needs to happen. They need to find him guilty. 
Jack Jones' trial began at the beginning of April 1996. And after hearing the evidence, and then along with Lacey's statement from a hospital bed, the jury found him guilty on all charges and the punishment the judge imposed for Mary's murder was death by lethal injection. He also yeah. received a sentence of life in prison for rape plus 30 years and a $15,000 fine for the attempted murder of Lacey. I agree with all of that, but $15,000 for attempted murder doesn't seem like a lot. It was 30 years plus plus that. 30 years plus 15,000. But where is he getting that money from? I don't know why they do this, because unless he had money, unless it comes out of his yeah. jail money, I don't know. But I don't even know if they can make money when they're on death row. Probably not. Anyway, while on death row, Jones confessed to killing two other women. So 32-year-old Lorraine Brent, who he assaulted and strangled to death in 1991. Later, he confessed in a letter to his sister that he murdered 20-year-old Regina Harrison in 1983 when he was only a teenager. Both Jesus. Yeah. See, so it's exactly what I said. He wasn't, there was oh, no. no excuse. He just wanted to do it. Yeah, that's why he's do it again. And both cases were officially linked to him through DNA evidence because, you know, it was prefer- preserved on the, on the, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the evidence. Uh, so every year, after a certain amount of years, when you're on death row, especially, you get like parole, not parole. A parole hearing. Yeah, like is, a parole hearing called. to stop the death execution. Sten- so, yeah, yeah, sentence going forward. Um, and after years of this, Jones just eventually just kind of stopped turning up. Lacey Blesser and the rest of her family turned up every single time to give her witness impact statement and just keep him where he needs to be. Yeah. And um, it is clemency hearing. So this is the hearing that not long before the death sentence is supposed to be carried out, they have like a, some last hearings to see if they can just stop or postpone the death sentence. Jones declined to attend his hearing in 2017 and instead sent his lawyer along to with a handwritten letter saying, I'm sorry, not only for what I did, but for you all having to come here. So that was sent to like Lacey and her family saying that he's sorry yeah. that she has to keep coming to these. He says if he's granted clemency, he would decline it. He wants to be put to death. So he kind of... Whether he was just fed up of prison or whether he kind of realised a little bit that he... That he's a fucking monster. Yeah, that he's a monster. So no clemency was granted and Jack Jones was executed by lethal injection on the 24th of April 2017. That is a long time, time. on I just, row. I just don't really understand the whole death row and you're going to be put to sleep like, why don't we just get it over and done with? I think they do it so that pe- innocent people don't get put to death. I think they leave it so yeah. long. And also, what's worse than having to just be on your own? Because I think usually death row people, they're on their own. It's isolation. Like, I'm in two minds about the whole lethal injection and, and putting people to death anyway, because it's like, well, they're not being punished, are they? Because then yeah. they're dead and like... it. Well, Whatever. he was definitely. I but think obviously he definitely that was. that is punishment. But then, but then, if you're going to be put to death anyway, then you're feeding, you're being kept by the system, aren't you? And like that costs money. Mm. Yeah, it costs money. But just think, that guy sat for what, uh, seventeen, like twenty years. Yeah, eighteen, nineteen, tw- like twenty-ish years. Yeah. So, knowing yeah, that he was yeah. going to die, there was no escaping it, and he was on his own. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. I think that I don't know. Yeah. People like him deserve to be punished, and it deserves to be horrible. But yeah, I'm in two minds about it. Sometimes I'm like, I oh, just get rid of him. They shouldn't even have to wait. Mm. It's just a waste of money. And then other times I'm like, yeah. well, no, they should be punished for it. Um, so anyway, Lacey is now married and, and a loving mother. And um, she knows that her mother mother was proud of her. 
damn straight she would be. Yeah. So she just said, you know, keep your head up and do the things in life that make you happy. She says it's her husband and her kids that make her happy and they always be there for her. Oh, bless her heart. And there we are. That's my story this week. Bless her. Bless her. Oh, thanks, Bex. That was bad. It was brutal. I think stories like that are particularly hard when you've got children that are similar ages. Mm. Anyway, let's go because we've been recording for a ridiculous amount of time. I know. Mostly due to my stinky, silly, noisy little dashund. He's a naughty boy, but he's very cute. He's very cute, very. but I don't forgive him tonight. He's been a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys and girls, thanks so much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. You can catch us in all the normal places, wherever you listen to your podcasts. We're still on Facebook. We're still on Instagram. We're still on TikTok. Still on Twitter. Please, still on Twitter slash X. Please share, like and subscribe. And you know what? Talk about us in the pub, down the bar, in the bowling alley, in a swimming pool with Audrey. Just talk about us to anyone yeah. that will listen. Please do, because it works. It definitely does. It does. All right, then. Thanks for listening, guys. Stay safe. Don't kill people. And keep it weird. Bye. Bye. She felt like there were eyes watching her from every shadowy corner. It made her skin crawl. Did you hear that? (laughs) 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 Meow. He's looking at you like, what's a (laughs) lid? Do you see how he's looking? He's embarrassed now. What did you do? Can really see him looking. He's like, I cat yawned, meowed. So <laughs> like, that's so embarrassing. I made a cat, cat noise. I wonder if it's like the, the, you know how we get embarrassed if we fart? I wonder if they get embarrassed if they accidentally make a cat noise. Oh no, I did that in front of everyone. It's like, shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Stop talking about me. He looked up to the ceiling and whispered, Oh! Ah! No, what did he whisper? What a cliffhanger. Ah! Well, I think he whispered, Daddy's home. Daddy. He whispered, It was me that pooed in the golf holes. <laughs> Emma's gone, and I don't know what this means for the recording. Oh, I hope it hasn't booked. It looks like it's still still recording. No, it still says it's recording. Am I come back? Baby, come back. Girl, you're my angel. You're my darling angel. angel. Closer than my peeps you are to me. Baby. Baby. You're my angel. You're my darling angel. Oh, excuse me, I burped. (laughs) (laughs) It was as if my headphones pulled out of me. I went, oh, sorry. (laughs) Let's move that off there. Right. So, my story this year, this week, this year, this, I did not (laughs) say that last year. Last (laughs) Oh, dear, it's too late. Um, Right. (gasps) Stop. I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm so sorry. You caught it. The first word was Johnny and it made me laugh. (laughs) Johnny. And and I looked at Tasha and she was like. (laughs) (laughs) I was trying to be serious. Hold on.